Welcome everyone to Schema and Metamodels and Ontologies Oh My, presented by David Long. My name is Don and I will be your host during today's webinar. David is the founder and president of Vitech. For over 25 years, he has focused on helping organizations increase their systems engineering proficiency, particularly in the areas of MBSE and digital engineering. And a cozy fellow and expert systems engineering professional, David was the 2014-2015 president of Encozy. Before David gets started, I do have a few housekeeping items. We will be answering questions throughout the webinar. You can send your questions through the questions tab on the webinar control panel. If we do not get to your questions, we, re we will reach out to you after the webinar. The webinar is being recorded. If you experience connection problems during the live presentation, a recording will be made available within one business day. The recording will be published to Vitex webinar archive located on our website. At the conclusion of this webinar, a survey will open on your screen. Please take a moment to give us feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you would like to see covered in future webinars. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to David. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Donna. Welcome, everyone. So lions and tigers and bears, oh my. It's always a great day when you can open a technical talk using a movie quote particularly a quote from a classic such as The Wizard of Oz. I certainly recall that mantra as Dorothy and her traveling companions journeyed down the yellow brick road. And it was a mantra partially of wonder and absolutely a mantra to help Dorothy and her friends control their fear, give them a sense of courage for the journey ahead. Schema and meta models and ontologies, oh my. I can't help but hear the same wonder, fear, and preparation as people use these words today. They are absolutely key to this journey ahead, the journey of model-based systems engineering, and even more so the journey of digital engineering. And there is a sense of questioning that goes behind these words. What are they? Why? And why now? We've survived somehow in systems engineering for over 60 years without these topics seemingly being critical, what's different today? So today we'll talk about the journey, how we got here. The journey to this point is always important. It provides essential context. Why is it important now? Why do these words matter in 2020 when perhaps they didn't matter as much before? What do the words even mean? But then most importantly, a practical path forward. How do we actually move forward and leverage these concepts appropriately? So in 2015 at the Encozy International Symposium, I had the opportunity to deliver a keynote talk on systems in 21st century systems engineering. And in that talk, I used this graphic of the Rosetta Stone. And I was talking about enabling communication, analysis, learning, and more. In doing so, I used what I called the dreaded O word, ontology. And I tried to expose the systems engineering community to that word. Wow, how far we've come in the past five years. This word is a dominant word in our vocabulary now. But what was I speaking about then? I was speaking of the need to communicate across and achieve a shared understanding on this transdisciplinary team. We know that a defining characteristic of systems engineering is addressing transdisciplinary problems. So we need concepts of ontology to enable communication and understanding. At, in 2015, we were also talking about the rise of systems engineering in multiple application domain areas. Now, systems engineering has been practiced in many of these areas for a long time, but the vocabulary is different. And so if you want to exchange practices and approaches from transportation and automotive to medical devices in aerospace and defense, how do we do that mapping, that translation? And then in the language of Encozy's technical director at the time, how do we unite the tribes? If you look across systems engineering, which is a vast practice, we have all these pockets. And how do we, instead of being pockets, how do we operate 
in sync. And so for that reason, I introduced the concept or the language, let's use it that way, the terminology of ontology in this talk. But if we go back, the reality is there has been this underlying information model that supports systems engineering as long as we've had a practice of systems engineering. From the very first military standard in 1969 through today's standards, through products such as the Incozi SE handbook, the issue is it is an implicit information model. You cannot go to any one of these references and open it up and find a defined vocabulary for systems engineering. What you find often is contextual information, processes, methods, and tools. So why the change? Well, fundamentally, implicit is manageable. It's not best, but it's manageable for humans. Implicit is not acceptable beyond that bound. And so if we look at the model-based systems engineering journey, it is one of the drivers that is moving us forward. We're trying to move from implicit understanding with our fundamental knowledge represented in diverse documents and artifacts to a more explicit information, one idea in one place, effectively digital clarity for systems engineering. In this journey, as we tackle more complex problems and as we bring computational technology to bear, we cannot tolerate implicit any longer. Hence the rise of the dialogue on ontology. But there's an artifact-based trap. We tend to fall back on this. This is very natural. We think about the work that we need to do. We think about the knowledge that we need to elicit and manage. But we tend to ask, can I produce the document? Or can I draw the diagram? Can I draw the diagrams in specific orders? In this case, it's in fact a bias towards a specific representational set, neither good nor bad, but it reflects that at the rise of the modern era of MBSC, we were trying to close the communication gap between system and software engineers. Regardless of what the artifact is, whether it's in document-centric systems engineering, diagram-based systems engineering, or model-based, it's not about the artifact. It's not the diagram, it's not the representation. It's also not about the process. It's about the elicitation, development, management, and communication of the information necessary to engineer a system. Once again, it's driving us away from artifact back to information, hence the rise, the importance of ontology and meta model. Now, in 2018, there was an important manifesto published called a model based engineering manifesto. Note, this is not model-based systems engineering. This is broader. This is model-based engineering. And it was published by a diverse team, modeled on the Agile Manifesto, where you state we favor A over B. What's the very first statement? If we're going to make this transformation to address complexity, interdependencies, other challenges, we must favor information over artifacts. This is why the ideas of ontology and meta model and schema, oh my, are so important these days. So what are these words? What do they mean? Sometimes they're used interchangeably. They absolutely are not interchangeable. If we try to state this rather simply, the most formal concept is ontology. So here's the Oxford language definition. Ontology, a set of concepts and categories in a subject area or domain that shows their properties and the relations between them. So what is the fundamental context? For us, it's engineering a system. What is the fundamental concept map within that? And what are the interconnections within that? So that we can have very clear representation of data information and knowledge. So ontology is the most formal term. But I'll tell you, 
The only time I use ontology these days is actually to say I don't use ontology. And the reason for that is, no offense to my academia, my friends in academia, but as the academics have grabbed hold of ontology, they've created these vast vocabularies of concepts and interrelationships. And our context is engineering a system. It's not a scientific endeavor, it's an engineering endeavor. So if I step back from ontology, let me step to meta model. Meta model, again, Oxford language, a model which is intended to give an all inclusive picture of a process, a system, anything, especially by abstracting it from more detailed individual models contained within it. Well, the issue here is there are all sorts of meta models. Could it be implementation based? For example, am I dealing with a relational database or an object oriented database? So everything has a meta model. Everything where you explicitly capture information that is, has a meta model. That's not useful. What's useful for us is a semantically meaningful meta model. That's what we're after. That's what we need in systems engineering. In other words, take the strong semantic concepts out of the formalism of ontology and put them at a level that is practical for engineering. Now, if you want to talk to a non-technical audience, if I talk to a technical audience, I use the term meta model. If I talk to a non-technical audience, I use the word information model. Either way, when you instantiate that in a repository in a database, the technical instantiation is a schema. It's the organization of the data as a blueprint. So the word that I prefer, and I will flip between them, during this hour, the word that I prefer is meta model or information model. But again, why is this important? Well, let's take the word function, for example. If you put a system engineer, a software engineer, and an electrical engineer in the same room and you use the word function, they will have three overlapping but different interpretations of that word. That is very, very dangerous. If you use a word I don't understand, then the odds of miscommunication are much lower than if you use a word that means one thing to you and a different thing to me. It's called a polyseme, words that have multiple meanings. If we're going to engineer across transdisciplinary boundaries in a world of complexity, we cannot handle those miscommunications. But there's another concept here. It's not just polysemes. How about relationships? There are two mental models that one can consider when you move from requirements in the problem space down into the architectural solution space. Do the requirements specify the architecture or does the architecture satisfy the requirements? You may think it's nuanced, but that nuance can get you in trouble. So that's why this concept is important. And again, the reason that I, I personally favor the middle word, as long as it is semantically meaningful, is because I'm after clarity, which I can still apply at an engineering level. Fundamentally, what we're after is the fact that we cannot afford misrepresentation, miscommunication. Implicit is fundamentally, sorry, explicit is fundamentally better than implicit. Clarity is fundamentally better than ambiguity across the team and through the system life cycle. But there is a trap of precision. We always need to be accurate. Sometimes we need to be precise. Sometimes precision in the face of accuracy creates problems. So at a particular stage in the system's life cycle, we need to be more precise later than earlier. That's why I put those as not necessarily greater than or less than the others, but explicit is better than implicit, clarity is better than ambiguity. In this journey towards a semantically meaningful language to underpin the engineering of systems, there's another trap that we have to avoid, and it's avoiding the perils of the extremes. So fundamentally, Systems engineering is seeking to left shift the collective insight, the collective intelligence of this transdisciplinary team, bring as much of the knowledge as far forward in the life cycle as we can. Well, there's a very famous Mink and misquote that says, 
For every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. I often hear, particularly in the world of ontology and meta model, people speak of simplifying complexity. You don't simplify complexity. Simple in the face of complexity is simplistic. That's the land of the con man and the naive. The other extreme is dangerous as well. I think we've all seen concept maps such as this one. Meeting complexity with complicated is also not the answer. It adds complexity rather than addressing it. We need to stay off the extremes and instead seek elegance. In our case, in our context, that's the language of systems, a language focused on systems concepts, interactions, and interconnections, a language that enhances understanding. So let's get practical. That's the what, that's the why, that's the why now. But what if you need to do something in this area? So as we shift into the practical mode, let's move towards, you can call it an essential systems meta model, a sparse information model, a minimal systems ontology. Interestingly enough, here I am talking about the importance of language, and I'm going to tell you, I don't care what we call it. We just have to have it in order to achieve some consistency of data and commonality of practice. Now, as systems engineers, we know that context is critical. If you change context for a problem, you get a different right answer. So let's set our context. First off, this will be used by humans to improve our communication, by machines to improve computation and reasoning, for systems engineering, for our practice, but most importantly, for engineering systems. The objective here is not to create a new silo called systems engineering. That is yet another trap. We need to do what we're going to do in a way that enables powers, drives the engineering life cycle. Now, on the other side, what are the usages? We often talk about interoperability, particularly interoperability of tools, or interchange, interchange of data across contractual boundaries. Yes, those are important, but what we're talking about is the information model that underpins our practice, our discipline of systems engineering. That means it actually underpins education and is the foundation for our discipline. If we do this properly, it eases and improves the understanding of systems engineering. And I think that's something that all practitioners would like to achieve, particularly as we continue to broaden the workforce. This information model, this semantically meaningful meta model, allows us then to move from what often appear to be disjoint processes, methods, and tools, to a cohesive framework. Again, what is the necessary information that we must elicit, analyze, and manage to engineer a system? If we understand that meta model, that becomes the skeleton upon which we can layer the right processes, methods, and tools to do what we need to do. So if this is the concept context, what are the foundational concepts? Well, you can't solve complexity with simplicity, but this simplicity gives us an, an abstraction. This pattern occurs over and over again. I don't think it's a natural pattern. I think it's a human pattern, a way of thinking, but it's still valuable and valid. We have some expression of need, of desire. In systems engineering, we call those requirements. They are the why behind our system. Those requirements feed the architectural solution space, which is primarily comprised of two aspects. A system is a realization statement, often called structure. A system does the behavior that the system exhibits, okay? So that is the solution. And then verification is the statement of a system's proof. Now, this is simple enough to understand, 
but so simplistic it's worthless in practice. That said, understanding this abstraction, you can see it in systems engineering, in operational architecture, in mission engineering, in program management, in verification and validation. The pattern occurs over and over again. If we go deeper to understand what is a useful systems meta model, what is a useful semantically meaningful language for systems engineering, well, let's walk through one. Now, I'm going to intentionally move from system, sorry, from structure, a system is, to behavior and beyond rather than flowing from top down. Effectively, the objective of systems engineering is to define the design envelope. And so our target is ultimately the specification of the structure of the realization. What are the pieces that we're going to specify components? What are the interconnections? We'll call them links. What are the connection surfaces? We'll call them ports. But the key is the information that we want, what's shown on the left, not the representation, not the visualization of it. Visualization is important to communicate. We need to be flexible in that for a transdisciplinary audience, but don't fall into the artifact trap. Use the artifacts to represent the information. And the information that we need on the physical architecture is what are the pieces, what are the interconnects, what are the connection surfaces. But a system is and a system does. So the does part of a system is what are the functions, or if you prefer activities, that the pieces of the system perform? What are the exchanges between those called items? Again, whether you represent them with activity diagrams and sequence diagrams or traditional notations such as FFBDs, IDEF zeros, and, and N square diagrams, I really don't care. What I care about is that we have the right information and we have the very explicit mapping so that we know what functions are mapped to what components because we're gonna ask a team to build that. What items are mapped to what links, connections, because that becomes the interface specification that our subsystems must comply with, conform to. So when we're specifying our solution, we're saying structurally what the system is and behaviorally what the system does, but we're not quite complete yet. As systems engineers, we also know there's the concept of state. Common example that I use here is I love the fact that my vehicle has an autonomous parking function. I really do not want that function to engage when I'm driving down the highway at highway speeds. A lot of system failures occur because the wrong behavior is exhibited in the wrong state. It's active when it should not be. And so if we're going to define the design envelope for detailed implementation, detailed design, we need to specify these aspects on the screen. That's the solution space. Why do we do it? The why behind our system is fundamentally the requirements, the expression of needs. Use cases are a particular tool that are helpful in the elicitation of that and the analysis of it to feed into the architectural solution space. But again, it's not about the visualization, it's about the knowledge capture. And then not only do we have to capture the why of the system, but we have to reflect how will we prove the system, concept of verification requirements and the test activities, et cetera. Again, we may have matrices and diagrams, it's the information we care about. Now, oftentimes people stop here, but there's other information of importance. There are things that we know and manage along the systems engineering journey. What are concerns that arise? questions where we have to evaluate alternatives and make decisions, probably in the face of assumptions and state rationale. What are the risks that we're identifying and managing? Hazard analysis, failure mode effect analysis, all these things go in this same general class. And by the way, systems engineering is not just descriptive architectural statements. We need to connect over to the real analytics of engineering so that there is rigor to the work, to the design envelope that we're defining. 
constraint definitions, if you prefer the word equations, that allows it to do this. Now, this is an abstraction of a systems meta model. There's more detail to a meta model than this, but it starts to give a practical reflection of what is necessary at the systems level to successfully engineer a system. The key here is it's not the artifacts. It's far more than diagrams. It's the information and the interconnections. It is far more than a data dictionary because it's not just the individual concepts, it's the interactions between them. Those relationships are critical. In systems engineering, in systems, emergent properties of the system come from interactions of the parts. In systems engineering, the key insight comes from the relationships between the concepts, ensuring that we have the consistency in the integration. It's far more than linear capture. If you understand the information model necessary to successfully engineer a system, you can move from what you know to what you don't. If I'm reverse engineering an existing system, I'm gonna start in the structural aspects and then flow outward. If I'm doing fresh top-down design, I'm gonna start with the requirements aspects but there's no linear flow. This is a network. Systems are networks. It's far more than specification. The concepts along the bottom give us the rationale, the context, the capture of the design journey. And it's more than the system of interest. We know what is done, why it's done. We capture it in a disciplined way that allows us to identify heuristics, that allow us to learn over time, it enables the engineering system, it enables the learning system. Now this is one metal model. What if you need to define your own metal model? Well, here are six steps for you that I would advise. First off, you need to recognize that systems engineering is relatively low on the maturity index because we don't have an agreed upon systems metal model that underpins our practice, our discipline. So if you go looking for the systems meta model, it doesn't exist. So what do you do? First off, you need to define what your scope is. And I will tell you that the scope of engineering is bigger than scope of modeling. Modeling is an essential part of it, but engineering is bigger than just modeling. Second, focus on the language of the domain. And in this case, the domain is systems engineering. The concepts that have evolved over 60 plus years of application, the language that we use is there for a reason. Now, I'm not telling us to be constrained by the past, but I'm saying wiping the slate clean is not necessarily a winning move either. You will increase the learning curve, and to be honest with you, you will make errors. What you're doing, if you ask practitioners to change their language, you're creating a barrier to adoption. Now, I know we're engineers. By definition, that means we're really, really smart people. Ask an engineer, he or she will tell you that. That said, there are experts in the, in the field of language design. We need to leverage our knowledge of systems engineering and their expertise in language design but we don't need a huge team. We should not have a meta model and ontology team of 20. We should have a core group, five to eight, and then a review community around us because much like strategy, meta models don't survive first contact with the enemy. You learn from the review, you learn from the application. Manage the size. A hundred concepts is much better than a thousand, is much better than 10,000 or a hundred thousand. And this is where the concepts or the application of modern ontology bothers me. Modern ontologies skew towards the right. At a systems engineering level, we need to skew towards the left. Emphasize the interrelationships. That's key to systems engineering. And begin with a proven base. Why? Like I said before, like strategy, a meta model does not survive first contact with the problem. You learn each time that one is done, why don't you start with something that's proven? What is proven? This is one of the challenges that we all face. 
This particular chart reflects our insights on various metal models. The Vitec metal model, which is freely available, we consider it part of the public domain, traces back to work done by TRW, now part of Northrop Grumman, in the ballistic missile defense field in the early 70s. Now, our model continues to evolve. It's based on our own insights, insights from practitioners, insights from other industry standards, such as DODAP and SysML. You'll notice along the industry line, there aren't as many points there. Many of the industry standards that exist are actually process centric, but there are some pieces out there. There is AP233, which is now part of AP239. There is the S-STAR meta model developed by Bill Schindel and ICTT. Then there are the DODAF, UML, SysML pieces. The danger here is that we end up with in meta models per organization, per project, or per practitioner. That's extremely dangerous. We need to somehow harmonize these, again, if we're gonna to get to consistency of data, commonality of practice. But how can you argue that for a field as broad and diverse as systems engineering that you can get to a harmonized meta model? Well, it keys in on what we're talking about. And I'm gonna to refer to a common core. If we look at the fundamental concepts of engineering a system, it doesn't matter if we're engineering a spacecraft, engineering a heart pump, engineering an information system. There is a common core of concepts that talk about expression of need, expression of solution, expression of proof, and the interrelationships that are applicable to any system. That's the common core that we can share as a single discipline. Now, around that red core, you can imagine a layer of tailored extensions. A particular organization may have their special sauce, the much better way that they do thing A or thing B. And that could have representational informational implications. So from a methodological or an organizational perspective, you may have your special sauce that wraps around the common core. But again, common to any kind of system. Where we need the concept of ontology and 100,000 concepts is at the domain specific level, where we start to connect between the common core of engineering systems with the specialized concepts of fluid flow and heat dissipation and electromagnetic interference or specific regulatory concerns. So the domain specific aspect, well, that will be much broader. We won't get to one of those, but we can get to one common core. If we get to that common core, it gives us the opportunity to align across the engineering enterprise because now that systems engineering, authoritative source of truth, can be the connective tissue that provides the right data to the right place at the right time in the right presentation. This is why we have to get away from artifact concepts and into semantically meaningful meta models so that we can have the right presentation for the right audience, whether that be a human, reasoning environment or a computing computational environment. When we do this, we need to see many, many different dimensions. Again, we tend to think, if you talk to practitioners, you tend to hear concepts of interoperability and interchange, which means people think about the tooling aspect. But if we step back, the representation of information, of data, of knowledge is a human problem. It's a cultural problem. It's a worldview problem. Earlier, I gave the example of do requirements specify architecture or does architecture satisfy requirements? That's a worldview statement. And so if we do this and we do it right, what we have to do is we need to unify these various dimensions tools, concepts, workflows, worldview, and most importantly, people, 
so that systems engineering can be the connective tissue to connect all the way from problem to solution across a transdisciplinary team throughout the life cycle. What we're talking about is a systems meta model that is that connective infrastructure that helps us unify the design space. Where have you heard language similar to that? You've heard it in digital engineering. This is the other why behind why ontology meta model are so important now. It's one thing if you're living within your silo, but if you're communicating across silos, you have to have defined meanings that you can trust. Now, you can map across those. So team A can use one language, team B can use a different language, particularly if they're in different disciplines, but they have to be semantically meaningful, ontologically meaningful. So if you want digital engineering, which is the critical enabler, for going faster, going better, going cheaper. You're not going to get there without good model-based systems engineering, which is the connective tissue of the digital engineering environment. And the only way that you're going to get there is again with that semantically meaningful meta model or ontology. Now I began this practical guidance with six do's. Let me identify a set of don'ts. So if you're undertaking this journey, here are 10 roadblocks or risks to be aware of. First off is overestimating your current implementation, whatever it is. It may be good, it may be shaky, but just because it's in use, don't necessarily believe that it's right. Next, well, let me say one more thing about that. In saying overestimating the current implementation, it's ultimately not about being loyal to the past. It's about enabling what we need today and tomorrow. To the degree the past informs us, that's great. To the degree that the past limits us, we can't tolerate that. Underestimating relationships, again, it's not enough to define what we, we mean by function and requirement and port. We've got to have the interconnections between those. The interconnections in systems engineering is what drives the interaction in systems. It's not about diagramming notation. That always pulls us back to the artifact level. Don't standardize at the notation level. Standardize at the systems concept level. I love tools like OWL. I love conceptual data modeling tools. But having one of those on my machine is like having Adobe Illustrator. Just because I have access to it doesn't make me an artist. Just because I have access to Al doesn't make me a language expert. So be aware of that. Standards. Now, one wrong standard is not good. 100 standard meta models is not good either because it's not a standard. And so the issue here is be, beware of proliferation of standards. Don't pursue perfection. See the journey through. Don't start and get distracted. And the last one, the concept of define and use is the equivalent of multiple standards. If everybody is defining for their organization, their project, their practitioner, their own core systems meta model, we cannot have interoperability, interchange, education or foundation. Define and use of a meta model is actually the enemy of the journey that we're on. If you undertake this journey, we have the opportunity to move from challenges to successes. I began with a discussion from 2015 and a presentation I gave on 21st century systems engineering. I'm gonna roll back one more year in time to 2014 when Encozy published Vision 2025, a world in motion. In that presentation, there's a chart with six fundamental challenges that are recognized across all systems engineering organizations, at least at that time. I've removed the sixth because it actually has to do with PowerPoint engineering, and I instead focus on five. But how can this concept of ontology and meta model and schema, oh my, 
help address this? Well, first off, in the race to deal with mission complexity, we actually have insights into the interactions and dependencies, both direct and indirect. This is why relationships are so important. And that equips the team to respond. They understand the impact of decisions, of mappings, of reallocations. In place of accidental architecture, architecture via assembly, what we have is with meaningful concepts across a transdisciplinary team, you can actually achieve shared understanding of problem and solution. The result, more resilient architectures because we've unlocked the collective insight of the team. Third point, we know that we lose knowledge at every phase gate because we hand information between teams, which is a loss. Now we can have an authoritative source of truth, not only of the design, but of the design journey that got us there. And so we can fundamentally accelerate the through life journey. And in place of knowledge lost across projects, with a common meta model, we have the opportunity to feed back in learnings, develop heuristics, et cetera. Finally, where technical and programmatic sides of projects often conflict, we can actually coordinate between them so that we can architect the program and architect the system, understanding as we propose changes to the solution, how does it impact not only the technical performance measures, but the business value, the value function. Going back to Dorothy and her journey down the yellow brick road, as you maybe start, perhaps continue your journey in the land of ontologies and meta models. What should you do? First off, look at your context, look across your silos, understand your scope. From there, be clear in your definition of the as is and the to be. The approach for one organization is probably not quite the same as the other because the scope is different, but the fundamental concepts can still be the same. Once you're there, implement a semantically rich approach to model-based systems engineering, and in doing so to the degree of digital engineering that you want and seek. And finally, the most important step on any journey is begin the journey. Hopefully you're already on this journey yourself. The best time to start a journey is sometime in the past. The second best time, start it today. When you hear the words of ontology, and meta model and schema. Oh my. Let's do away with some of the fear. Let's embrace a sense of opportunity and let's go forward to advance our projects, our systems, and ultimately the practice and discipline that we serve. With that, got time for our questions. Thank you, David. We do have a few questions that have come in, thanks to our participants. I encourage you to join the discussion now and, it's, and submit your questions using your webinar control panel. If you need to leave the webinar, please take a moment before you go to respond to the quick survey that will pop up on your screen. Our first question today is, what about SysML or SysML v2? Um, how would that affect it, us? Okay, so let me talk about those two slightly different. So SysML, SysML, well, let me take a step back. UML recently celebrated, I can't remember if it was the 20th or 25th anniversary of its first publication. And the founders of UML expressed a bit of surprise of how UML is treated today versus how it was originally developed. It was originally developed effectively as a sketching language. And what that means is, I said earlier, that everything has a meta model. The question is whether it's a meaningful meta model. So UM, SysML, systems modeling language, being based on UML, shares the same semantic strength, or in this case, weakness, because it was intended as a sketching language. A fundamental objective of SysML v2 was to increase the semantic strength, to put a true meta model at the core of that. Now, that journey is still ongoing. We will know later in 2021 
what the first V2 meta model is, what the rigor is. I know it will be semantically more precise. It is absolutely at the system design level. It is actually more at the modeling level, so it doesn't embrace the breadth of engineering. It is bigger than system LB1, but it's on its journey. The question that we have yet to know, and we will see, is how well does it satisfy the need to express the concepts in the language of systems, and how far does it go? We know that we will have to continue to wrap around it, and that's okay, but it's definitely going to be progress. How far it goes, well, let's talk again in about nine months. Thank you. Our next question, um, can you give a concrete example in digital engineering? Okay, so I mentioned that where the systems, where a semantically meaningful meta model really comes into play is powering digital engineering. If we talk about the interface between, let's say, the systems architecture team and a detailed design team, you've asked me to be precise, let me take electrical because I know I've worked through problems in that area. How do you take the lowest level concepts in systems engineering and map them over to create a continuous flow so that they are the highest level concepts driving electrical design. Well, in this case, we have the concept of a component at the systems level, which becomes effectively a functional block at the highest level electrical design. It's one of your components. Your links are your, for example, wire harness, so you can directly map your semantics over there. Your ports map, the concepts are similar. You've got the concepts of signals. In systems engineering, we're talking generically about items. At the electrical engineering level, those are signals that are traversing that wire harness. And so you can start to see how, if you've got a semantically meaningful representation of the data, you can synchronize at the lowest level of system architecture and highest level of detail design. And I say synchronize because ultimately it's not a one-way flow. What we have to do at that level is expose it to both teams and be able to iterate at that interface as we combine the insights at the system level where de we're defining the design envelope and detailed knowledge from the detailed design, in this case, electrical engineers, that give us feedback on perhaps the validity or other aspects of the system architecture. Hopefully that's one semantically meaningful example. Uh, there's also a pattern there. Thank you. Um, our next question is, I understand that using a meta model or clearly defined information helps to get a team accurate with a consistent source of truth, but what is needed additionally to make the team live the model and have the mental picture to work effectively together and to truly understand it? Well, that's, it's a, that's a really good question because you're reflecting back that this is fundamentally a human problem, not a computer problem, actually not even an MBSC problem. So the first part of it to me is you've got to agree upon what the fundamental context is. Good systems engineering is always fit to the problem, fit for purpose. So how is your MBSC effort, let's go ahead and frame it that way, how is your MBSC effort allowing you better insight and the necessary predictions that you must make so that you can specify and narrow the design envelope? Get your team to align around that because that's effectively some worldview concepts. From there, also look very carefully at the workflows and the required processes, methods, et cetera, that you want to support. If you can make this meta model support, enable, help the engineers do their job, you've got a better chance of success. If this is seen as an overlay, a bureaucratic aspect, uh, a tax, anything that is non-helpful, then you're going to trigger resistance. Organizational change management at a team level, hopefully that fit for purpose context uh, helps to guide you on a very good question. 
Okay. Um, thank you, David. That wraps up the Q&A for today's presentation. If you have other questions or comments for David, don't hesitate to send him an email. You can see his email address on the screen now, or you can post your questions and comments on our LinkedIn group page. Just visit linkedin.com and search for Vitech. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Please join us in 2021 for more webinars on SE, MBSC, and all things Vitech. Remember that at the conclusion of this webinar, a survey will open on your screen. Please take a moment to give us feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you would like to see covered in future webinars. Once again, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day.